Hey guys, welcome to Adventure Fit Radio. Today uh, on the show, we're talking to um, Dr. Michael Inglis, who is a performance and exercise psychologist. He has been working in the mental health field since 1999 and has the full training as a sport and exercise psychologist that is accredited with the AHPRA and the APS. It all sounds very interesting to me. Uh, I don't really understand a lot of it, but that is so cool. That's why I wanted to get him on the show. Um, he He's a psychologist that I myself uh, spoke to um, and went and saw a couple of years back when I was uh, dealing with some shit, dealing with some, some stuff um, with footy and um, some general anxiety, and he's fixed me up real good. So um, I was more than happy to, to have him on the show. Uh, Maka and Bill were there. We spoke about um, everything from uh, from his involvement with the AFL um, to off-field sort of stuff, to stuff he's launching now, and um, had a really cool chat. Had um, heaps of band. It was awesome. Uh, let's have a quick look at the sponsors. So the sponsors, guys... Uh, we always want to make sure that we're uh, we're uh, giving a shout out to the sponsors. They helped us so much on the show with uh, with launching it, and um, we really couldn't be uh, couldn't be. Uh, <laughs> Bill's just getting it up for me now. We're having a little laugh over this. Um, we uh, we couldn't be where we were in all this without them. So so really good. So Apple Apple Atlanta Orchards guys. Apple varieties, Canty and great stuff. What are you laughing? At? <laughs> so Atlanta Orchards guys. Apple uh, varieties and Canty Green Star have been trialled in Australia for years and are now in commercial production. Both were bred in Belgium and are now growing across the country, including Victoria. Green Stars, the first 100% non-browning apples, are a cross between a Granny Smith and a Del Barristaval apple. So the apples are green, sweet, juicy. I've eaten an apple before. They are bloody good, let me tell you that. Have a thin skin and have the highest vitamin C content of any apple, which helps keep them naturally white for days after cutting. Seriously good stuff to keep. The, uh, the Kanzi is the number one apple sold in Europe and is bright red and crunchy with a long shelf life. Cross between a Gala and a Bray Berm apple. Okay, so ask for Atlanta Kanzi and Green Star apples in your local green grocers, Victoria Wide team. There, they're really good stuff. Um, we're going to start eating a lot more in, on. Uh, going to start eating a lot more of them on the show, guys. They're really good. Our uh, our second sponsor, guys, we want to give a shout out to is Locksam Solutions. Locksam Solutions is a boutique consulting and business support company focused on business consulting and commercial services. The key to their success has been through the application of a pragmatic approach combi- combined with entrepreneurial spirit to achieve our clients' outcomes. Their philosophy is simple, deliver well-defined, measurable business outcomes to their clients through the engagement of subject matter experts with real-world experience. Services include business consulting, costings, business structure, business start-up advice, business plan development, review and adaptation, organizational review and restructure, operational review and restructure, governance, corporate and operational, coaching, mentoring, project management, financial management. They can be found, so those guys can be found at www.locksamsolutions.com.au. So guys, please check them out if you have the time. Um, will definitely be worth your while. Finally, team, No Days Off Supplements is a newly formed company that aspires to build a trusted brand by having honesty, integrity, and loyalty at the cornerstones of our relationships with all our stakeholders, from suppliers to customers to sponsored athletes and individuals, we will work hard to ensure all receive the utmost attention and support and that harmony, harmonious relationships and mutually beneficial outcomes are achieved. The company was formed with the vision of offering great products and sound information that will benefit its customers and the community at large. No days off supplements, guys, for all your support needed. Not to mention Adventure Fit. NDO, 10% off when you mention Adventure Fit Radio. <laughs> Radio. I keep screwing it up, guys. I'm reading, I'm honestly at the moment reading off a computer and reading off a board and looking at Bill's face. He goes, what the fuck are you doing? So, sorry, guys. Not to mention NDO, mention Adventure Fit ADVF Radio for 10% off all supplements, please. Finally, team, Adventure Fit Travel, our mother company. It's going to Bali. We have extended sales until the 11th of March. Some of the stuff we're doing on Bali, guys. 
Clock off. Dimitri, clock off. Uh, Bill's just trying to dick. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> clock off. Dimitri, clock off. That is, guys. World weightlifting champion. I've done uh, two seminars with the bloke. He's a big boy. He's, uh, he's a very big boy. He's got... He's got some insane numbers in white things, so please check him out, guys. There will be rafting, there will be snorkeling, there will be surfing, and more. The list just goes on and on and on, guys. Extended sales till the 11th of March. Please jump on. It's going to be sick. All righty. Without further ado, I give you Adventure Fit Radio, talking to Michael Inglis. So we're sitting here with Michael Inglis from The Mine Room. Michael is a sports psychologist. Uh, I'm sitting with Mac to my left and Tommy to my right. Hello. G'day. And as usual, before we welcome Michael, we're going to start off with, uh, with Tommy's tribute. Okay. Buckle so, uh, Mike, this is something... Sorry, Michael. Sorry. It's my <laughs> fault. Um, <laughs> very professional here. <laughs> Let's call um, you Mike for the rest of the show now. Michael, yeah, I'll call you Mike for the rest of the show now. Yeah. Um, this is something I like to do. It's one of the segments we do on the show. Um, I'll do like a cover of a famous song. Um, I'll write my own um, words in it and I just like to sort of tribute the guests um, purely because I have a lot of time on my hands <laughs> and I want everyone to know that I play the guitar. <laughs> All the ladies out there, I play the guitar. <laughs> All right. So this is Steamroller Blues by Tom Hearn. Well, I'm sitting here with Inglis. He's a man of the mind. I don't know much about him except this is what I could find. He said he works with the AFL. <laughs> and I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm sad and all alone, I know just who to call very bluesy oh yeah <laughs> well <laughs> Inglis has his own place it's called the mind room it deals with mental health now baby and the reason I know this is because I went there after an episode on the shrooms <laughs> he's saying he works with the <laughs> AFL <laughs> <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when I'm sad and all alone, I know just who to call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well played. Thank you. That was a good one, well Tommy. Well played. <laughs> Another fantastic start. Did that break the Hurricanes um, world record for the longest song ever? Or? Uh, <laughs> this just in, it did. Yes. <laughs> Great stuff. So, welcome to the show, Michael. Welcome to Adventure Fit Radio. Thank you. Thank you. Now I know why Tom was asking me all these questions about my personal background. <laughs> <laughs> it was all just to fit the lyrics of his song. Yeah. I thought, and now I'm glad I didn't answer any of them. Is there, is there anything <laughs> else that you do, Michael, that rhymes with pineapple? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like, this is a lot of in-depth questions yeah. for a radio interview. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah good stuff. Uh. So, so you're a sports psychologist, Michael. Why don't you tell us about um, basically what you do and, uh, and a little bit about your current role in the AFL? Yeah, so at the moment, um, my, I guess I can split my role into two. Um, I spend half my time at the North Melbourne Football Club, my other half time in my practice called the Mine Room, which is generally a wellbeing and performance psychology place. So we opened this up, myself, Joe Mitchell and I, uh, just over three years ago, just going to our fourth year, um, with the idea that a lot of psychology practices are very deficiency-based, uh, where people have mental health issues um, and they want to get better, which is you know, obviously a market we wanted to, uh, to serve as well. But we thought there's very few places that actually serve people that are already well but want to thrive or get better in life. Ah. Um, so that was our that was our pitch, or that was what we our, our framework we wanted to work on um, to look at both angles. Optimizing. Yeah, that's exactly that's right. Mm. Um, and then yeah, the kangaroos job came in uh, middle of last year, and I've been splitting my time between the two there. Cool. So when you talk about mindset, um, what are the what are the key things that you want to you want to get across to an athlete? when they are wanting to improve their mindset 
mm. or wanting to bring themselves out of a low patch. What's the um, start us off with? With um, give us an example. Yeah, look, to me, mindset really, in athlete terms, is, a, is another word for attitude. Um, what attitude do they want to take into that season, that match, that quarter, whatever it might be? Um, and what is it they actually want to frame? What do they really want to focus on at that point of time? Um, and, and getting that clear for them, it's more about a clarity or getting some clearness in their own mind about what they want to carry through or what their focus points are, mm-hmm. whatever that season or competition might be. Um, and to get that specific in their own mind, so it's very clear. So what we know about athletes is when their minds are jumbled and they kind of lose objective about why they're there or, or yep. what they're particularly wanting to do, um, it generally is to poor performance. Mm. So would you, is it a, a big part of you, uh, your structure when you deal with an athlete to set goals? Is it to put it all into perspective and then work through those goals? Is that part of the plan at the, at the start? Yeah, so goal setting is a, is a pretty good pretty good example about how we can de- develop a clear clarity around that mindset mm-hmm. um although i try and i'm trying to get away from the goal setting language goal setting's been around for a long time um what should we be calling it goal getting <laughs> goal getting uh, <laughs> very different uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. i like it <laughs> goal setting like with it. a g <laughs> the reason the reason is is because anyone can goal set very yeah. few can goal get yeah. yeah so new year's resolutions is a perfect example that any of us can oh, use isn't God, it no. um do you do you think um what about the the um, theory of setting your goals super high. So if you set your goal to be the greatest in the world at something, you're s- setting your goals high so if you don't quite get there, you're still probably going to be at a lofty level. Okay, so you're doing the you're trying to create a ceiling effect yeah. to kind of push yourself as much as possible because if there's any lower, you know, you would probably reserve yourself in yeah, that time. Is, is that something that what are, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, no. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's cool. The evidence kind of suggests that if they're not realistic, that they aren't attainable, that at some point we'll get the I'll use layman's terms, what the hell effect? Yep. Um, that makes sense. That it's just gonna be too far away, and at some point I'll lose interest because it's too far away. I'm so glad you said that because I'm definitely a realist, and I uh, I've been told to set more achievable, oh, sorry, uh, higher goals uh, to try and get the best out of myself, but. I'm definitely a realist and, and uh, quite happy when I achieve my goals. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's a balance, isn't it? You obviously don't want them too low either because then it's not, yeah. it doesn't stretch you. We want to stretch you, but you've got to feel like it's always attainable. Yeah, that's one of the, that's A in smart goals, isn't it? Really? Yeah. So my, my dad used to tell me uh, the theory that I just explained. So what was that one? Don't eat the yellow snow. <laughs> 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 no, to set your goals super, super high and if you don't get there, then you're going to fall somewhere you know, relatively right. high as well. Yep. But we just found out that my dad's an idiot. <laughs> 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 well, well, there are, uh, <laughs> maybe, I mean, maybe they could work on a specific group that always appear to be lower motivated yeah, yeah, and right. underachieved, yeah. perhaps, you know, uh, no offence to you or your dad, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> All offence would take it there. <laughs> Actually, I'm offending you and your dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, as a general, no, no. Yeah. It's um, most people will lose complete confidence in themselves and just kind of completely let it go if they feel like it's too high. Well, it's out of, out of reach. What's the almost? What's the point? Mm. You're not going to be rewarded with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like um, if I wanted to climb Everest, am I and I end up, you know, <laughs> thousand meters short? <laughs> is that a success? <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> that's a huge. That's fail. a really good analogy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's really. Yeah. that's not what you want at all. <laughs> just for um, everyone at home, a bit of background. I actually. Um, Went and saw um, Michael and this um, was a couple of years now ago, wasn't it? Was yeah. it five or yeah? Um, had some um, some stuff going on with um, just uh, footy. I need to get. I just didn't. I was. Uh, I don't know. I reckon I was looking back on it so I said about wanting to make the AFL and stuff. But um, then it was something else with anxiety and all this other sort of stuff. But I just remember the the biggest things we used to go over was just goal setting and you know going on. Bill was saying like. You can have a, a massive goal, like we, we you know, write, wrote the long-term goal of making the AFL, but then we nutted that down into short-term goals that you can sort of apply to that. So is it, it's not necessarily, you know, making it a long-term goal is a bad thing, but just having the process in place so it becomes very real. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's what we call it. So there's a hierarchy of goals, mm. and what we're talking about now is dream goals. So dream goals would be what you couldn't achieve now or this year, but you might want to do it in the next five years or so. Mm-hmm. So, and this one year will be one step to that bigger goal. You know, so um, in terms of what you're talking about, there's nothing wrong with having that out of reach goal right now, as long as you see that you, as long as you create another goal that would be a step towards that, mm. that would be quite reasonable, which is what 
Tommy's talking about. And it definitely worked because, I mean, you know, now I don't play footy at all and I'm a crossing. <laughs> 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 so, well done. <laughs> now, now, in, in that, you, uh, you're going to be dealing with uh, people who uh, hold a lot of fear and, and not only fear of failing, but fear of succeeding as well. And, um, you know, there's a lot of victims out there that uh, are just a victim to life and, and they're used to failing. Um, you know, whether it be an example, could be, uh, you know, an abusive relationship and, and they just think they're not worthy of someone else or, or even someone who wins the lotto, um, you know, often a couple of years later, their $7 million or whatever they win is gone. And, and generally it's probably because they feel they're not worthy enough to have this money or, or have this success. Mm. So how do you change someone's mindset to then, um, be more positive and set more achievable goals that are uh, higher than their vision. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think there's a there's a few different a uh, few different concepts you're kind of raising there. I mean, they, a there's about fear, both in failure and success, and then you're kind of talking about the psychological concept of uh, self-esteem and mm. and who they and how worthwhile they believe they are, and and kind of mixing them together. And I just, we had a bit of a chat on air about the complexity of my job mm. where most people come to me wanting to improve their performance about developing that mindset. And the, the, under, the undercurrent in all of that is what are some of the, the mental health or the pathologies underneath this? So when we're talking about fear, we're talking about anxiety, mm. when we're talking about worthlessness or sense mm. of value, we're mm. talking about, okay, about their self-esteem and who they really believe they are. And so therefore, the, the complexity is, well, I want you to you know, A from A to B in my whatever my performance may be, but you've got all this under, undercurrent um, preventing them from there. I'm a real believer of hitting that undercurrent pretty early mm -hmm. um, and talking about it. And th that can be uncomfortable and pretty confronting for some people. Um, but you're quite right. We need to talk about, well, we don't, there's no point having some aims and goals, this whole performance work, if you're not going to take the final leap because of this mm -hmm. underlying fear that you have. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, so you'll dig up the past 10 years later before you even go for the uh, winning uh, the grand final. Well, see, so yeah, that, uh, I'm, the way I kind of, I guess, work with people is I actually give them the option. I go, this is what I see. This is what, I, this is what I'm formulating happening. Mm. This could potentially get in the way from you actually attempting your goal. Do you want to work with this or you want to go for it anyway? Because you've got to allow, you've got to empower people to make yeah. that choice. Because they may not do the 10 years of therapy yeah. before they know. I just want to do it now, yeah. you know. You've got to make up another game plan to... To yeah, yeah. To it. I mean, I, I can only I can express it and, and formulate as best as I can for them. They've got to make the choice because mm. some people are really impatient, believe it or not. Yeah, um, I can imagine. And mm. it's particularly on the performance setting, you know, we go. I want to win now. Yep. Well, there's a lot of money at stake as well. Yep. They've got a, a goal that's right in front of their eyes, and yep. uh, you know, why why talk about five years ago when grand finals coming up this year? Yep. And maybe, you know what, even giving them the option goes, hey, I know that's there. I've developed more awareness of it now. Michael's mm. called me on it. He will call me on it again if it comes up again. So even that might be a way of actually dealing with it, depending yeah. on how severe it is or not. But, um, yeah. How so just to, sorry, um, Doco, um, specific. So you're saying someone may not have the right mindset to really try and achieve, like Maka said, that grand final or that, you know, that win or something. So you're saying go back a couple of years to see what maybe is stopping them or is that wall that's um that's stopping from doing that and then trying to address that now is that is that really tough for people yeah it is yeah. i mean because it's it's confronting to say to actually s to have someone say to you in the room you do not value yourself or mm. realizing that you don't because mm. um, the whole time we like to go around saying hey i deserve good things in life and to think they're actually undermining that process um, is really difficult to swallow, mm. I think, for people, mm. um, as common as it might be. I think it would hurt a lot of pride as well, people with um, that are, you know, on that level. I mean, they probably have some sort of an ego to say, hey, look, you know, this is stopping you. Mm. This is a big sort of kick in the balls. You know? mm. yeah. What about, um, do you think there's some sort of a, a vicious cycle in high-level sport? S um, going back to what Tommy was talking about with anxiety to reach the AFL, mm. I felt like my, uh, my junior football career was the same. I was pretty talented, but my mindset I just couldn't get a handle of it and mm. I never reached I wouldn't have made it to the AFL I'm I'm sure I wasn't born with the skills I, I found that out but I would have played a lot higher football and played better had my mindset been okay but do you think at the top level that it's a kind of a vicious cycle and the pressure of being at the top leads to whatever the underlying problems are of anxiety and depression is it kind of feeding itself yeah, so before I was with the Kangaroos I spent a lot of time with the AFL Players Association so I spent a lot of time with players um players off field and so you saw the the stresses um that they were going through when 
um, kind of away from the club. What we what we kind of know is particularly around players who aren't established yet. So mm -hmm. guys who are maybe on the fringe, they're on the list, but they're on the fringe. You know, final years contracts. We find in the between the first four years of being on the list is really difficult because um, they probably the again what's that? Just getting used to the spotlight. Yeah, pressure, and, and, and just finding do I belong here? Yeah, I think no it's a really big one. Good enough. Yes. Yeah, yep. I mean, even even guys we think are high picks who play straight away, they still have, you know, is this. Do I, have I got this yeah, all sorted? Absolutely. You know, everybody gets to a level. I think that they're they're comfortable through D, C, B, and then they'll get to A, and and they'll be like, oh, I, I, mm. I don't belong here. That's how it was for me and everything that I've ever done. Mm. I always feel comfortable to some extent. They'll walk through one door, mm. and my mindset totally changes for no reason, no apparent reason, and it comes and out that uh, that self worth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've always valued myself. I think, but on a on a sporting sense, I didn't value my. Talent, I suppose that's self-worth, I suppose, yeah. But, you know, when you're kind of going through those steps, a less talented athlete who had to had to develop a mindset to get to the same position as you might be better off because they've already used those psychological yep. skills to get mm. there. We're a highly talented one and there's plenty of first-round draft picks that we see mm. who have just by pure physical talent have got there, um, never had to use any psychological skills mm. and they get there and they have mm. to and they really struggle in AFL because they've never had to use those psychological skills. 100%. Do you think, Tommy, I don't know about, about you, and going back to your, your 22 now, so this mm. is probably five or six years ago, this is before you um, meditated and were yeah. kind of got to your spirituality level that you're at now. Do you think it would have been a totally different scenario had you been in the position you are now with your mind? Yeah, I think um, I think it's funny, actually, the mind room and yourself, Michael, I'm not going to give you a massive shout-out here, but you're the best man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, you actually did... Um, you probably were the catalyst that led me down the path of uh, spirituality and meditation. This is something that us three are all huge on. Um, I think it would be totally different, but I think what I probably would have seen earlier was that the dream of AFL wasn't something I truly wanted. I think looking back now, I, I looked at it as it's a goal of, oh, you know, when you make it to the AFL. I, I honestly remember telling myself this, um, and it became known to me when I used to speak to you, you know, um, when I make the AFL, I'm, I'm going to get all the girls. I'm going to have all this money. I'm just going to be like a superstar. And so I train and train and train. And that training, you know, we've all heard a, I don't even know what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was a uh, hum harul hum. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> all I heard was girls and money. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, I, um, I, um, God, now I'm thinking of girls and money. You just <laughs> and the Benjamins. That's right. So I, I, I think you're trying to say that you were you were training for the wrong reason. You're going yes. down for the wrong reason. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And now I've found CrossFit, and I don't know really like the, there's probably a bit of irony there, but um, in doing all that training, I've found the love of training, and I go into CrossFit every day and you know do all that sort of training, and I love being there every day irrespective to my goals with the sport or with the, you know, in the fitness community. Mm -hmm. I love doing it every day. And that's the real difference. I, I found that, um, you know, looking back on it through meditation, you know, through meditating and, and all the stuff that we did together, that it was never really, I wanted to be an AFL player. I just want, wanted some of the stuff that goes along with being an AFL player. Yeah, when you're, when you're a teenager, that's all the stuff you want. Yeah. You want fame. You want to be cool. You want to be where people can see you. Yeah. I mean, it's all the most petty stuff. Oh. I never wanted to play football for anyone but Rye Football Club. Would never when I was playing footy. It, yeah. People could throw money at me as a as a local footballer. I'd never move to any other club. But I, for some reason, wanted to play AFL for in Rye. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the Rye AFL football. Club. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, for that reason, just for all the all the bells and whistles. Yep, yep, definitely. But so uh, so going back to what we we're talking about before, you've got someone who um, you know is a has a lot of doubt and not uh, not a lot of self worth. How do you? Uh, approach that person to eliminate their doubt yeah good question i think we need to sometimes you know in a very therapeutic viewpoint we can go what are the origins of that and mm. see if there's any kind of validity there because sometimes we can kind of make up what i call stories in the back of our own mind that actually aren't really true mm. and sometimes do, do we go back and revisit that to actually articulate if they are or not and we go sometimes it's a bit of a surprise like actually there's actually not that much evidence for what i've created in my own mind but because it's been circling in your own mind for so long and you haven't mm. shared it you actually believe it's true, mm. um, but there's obviously there's some some plate there's occasions where um, it is true, mm. and there's things you kind of need to process or overcome, and so we would then kind of we would kind of call on, on some mental skills around that, whether it be about some self talk, uh, visualization, things like that to so maybe overcome it, so we don't have this uh, pressing framework where we just keep on referring to that doubt each time there's a time to really thrive. Mm. Mm. 
how powerful the visualization is. I think it's really I've, powerful. I've done a lot of it and it's uh, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, like it's a, one of the best, depending on the sport, but I think mm. it's one of the best, uh, one of the best mental skills athletes. And so, so I'm a weightlifter. Clients. How would I? So if I've actually, um, just for my own benefit right now, I've got a competition in um, a week's time, basically, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it'll be the first time I've been I've stepped foot on the platform in 20 months. Mm-hmm. I've had um, back problems. On and off uh, throughout the last yeah two years basically. So, if I was to try and use visual uh, visualization, <laughs> what was, that? <laughs> <laughs> was that Tommy's word? <laughs> there was a double Z in there. Sorry, I think <laughs> 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 Benjamin. <laughs> That's right. Um, <coughs> visualization. Visual. <laughs> I can't even say it. Visualization. Vis. Vis. Um, Vis. If I'm to try and use visualization <laughs> to my benefit before my comp. So, what's an example? Is it before the night before? Is it the day of? Explain it to me. Yeah, you could actually do, I would say you could do your training quite regularly leading up to it. Now, it depends on yours. I imagine in the competition, you might have f- several different types of competitions in the competition. So, what we do is we have uh, we have three lifts of the, of the snatch. That's okay. the first exercise. Then we have three lifts of the clean and jerk. You'll have a, an hour-long period where you'll lift point A. You'll maybe have 10 minutes in between point B, point C. Yep. You'll have three breaks and then you'll have a half an hour in between the clean and jerk and you'll do the same thing. Okay. So I think in that kind of competition, what we call like it's a very much a closed skill, which means you get to time when you do the lift. I know you probably have, you got to win 30 seconds or whatever, but yep. you actually can, you can call it. It's not a reaction to something else. Like AFL would be example. It's constantly moving continuous. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's hard to stop and visualize, of course, mm. uh, where you have a lot more control to do that. So it would be good to do in your, your training when you do it to actually, there's different types of visualizations, I should say. And so the one I'm going to talk about now is what we call mastery. Imagine yourself doing it well or to the yep. best of your ability. So you'll be visualizing yourself uh, doing a clean snatch yep. successfully. I said you move the, uh, <laughs> you move the, cross, uh, the weightlifting and crossfitting yeah. world. Yeah. 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 The clatch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's the snatch and the clean. Uh, the two Sorry, so that's why, we, that's right. why we're giving you shit. Just say no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you would actually visualize yourself do it before yep. actually physically going through the motion. So your brain, you wired your brain to how to do it successfully before your body has to do it. So, i.e., the mind drives the body. So, for example, I always see this in... Uh, I never do it when I step foot on the platform, but you have a minute to take your lift okay. and you can walk, step foot on the platform with 60 seconds to go. And you can do whatever you like up there mm. as long as you're lifting the 60 seconds. And quite um, quite regularly, you'll see people stand on the platform, they'll address the bar, so they'll stand up to the bar. They'll close their eyes and they'll stand there with their eyes closed. You don't know what they're thinking about. What are they doing? What are they? This is obviously their routine. They'll stand there for 15 seconds. They'll have some a few deep breaths and then they'll, they'll attack the bar. So that's probably... Uh, is that the term, uh, the time that you would you yes. would go to do it? You would stand yep. there right before you're about to go, see it all play out in your head, and then yep. go and try and do it. Yep. So the it's the best prepared athletes will do that. They'll have a routine that is timed, and maybe even the breathing fits in. They'll have a certain amount of breaths um, before they actually go for their lift. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of that could be visualization. There's different type of techniques, but the visualization is one you can use. The visualization I did for my weightlifting. That, that's how I got onto it. it was my yep. first weightlifting comp. And uh, I was told the night before, um, you, when you're lying in bed and you can't get to sleep because you're so anxious, uh, you just visualize yourself. And uh, if you see yourself miss the lift, you rewind, mm-hmm. like the old uh, video, you rewind mm-hmm. the, the tape and you keep replaying that scene until you see yourself make the lift. Mm-hmm. You see yourself make the lift, you feel what it was like and you move on straight away and, you right. and then that's your success. And every time I did that, you know, whether I was going to, uh, you uh, you could call it I, uh, it was lucky, or you could call it I visualized it. But I uh, every time I did that, I was successful. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So even visualizing visualizing, visualizing the obstacles, <laughs> we're all, <laughs> we're all <laughs> we are all struggling with it. <laughs> <aren't> <laughs> <we>? <laughs> I'm going to go back to imagery. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah imagery. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, actually, having the obstacles to overcome and going through that process is just as important. Mm. So, uh, you know, being able to see yourself overcome it because you don't want to be caught by surprise. Mm. So we're trying to, we're virtually re we're trying to wire the brain and remind the brain of, okay, how do we overcome something? How do we do something really well? Um, so it's all very familiar by the time we actually get to competition day because we don't want the extra stress of that mm. actually affecting um, exactly the process. That it feels mm. very familiar. We've already done it a thousand times. I just have, sorry, Maka. I just have one issue with it, and I, because I tried it a few times, and um, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, and I just felt that like I had this routine. I think I did it with um, going in for a set shot. I'd always just like 
you know, miss or whatever. Um, and I started to think, okay, let's have a couple of steps here and there, get your breathing right and all these sort of, you know, processes and I would hit it um, and it would work. And then I started to think, this is probably me being over analytical with it, um, but I started to think, shit, you know, if I don't get one step right or if I don't breathe at that moment, like, will that screw up my whole routine and then, you know, will, uh, will I miss it? And that's probably just, again, um, being that over anxious sort of thought process. But do, do you have that? Do people say that too? Yeah, or? they're 100%. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, it, there's a difference between having a structured routine and being rigid. Yes. Um, and that's you being rigid. Yeah. Yep, um, yep. So, and athletes can be, you know, they're very superstitious. Was, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, what, they can be really, they can, be, they can hang on to things very tightly. Mm. So, we're always, and we've got to pick our personalities when we're working with them a little bit for exact exact reason. Yes. Yep. Um, that when there's people that will be so finely tuned that you actually need to calm them down yeah, and actually, yeah. actually have a bit more flexibility around it. To and compensate. the superstition's mainly just for a, a comfort, isn't it? It's yep. like, okay, everything's in place. I can relax. Yep. I'm comfortable. Yeah. So it's like a placebo. Just, just if it works for them, if that's going to make them comfortable, you're happy yep. with people to go for superstitions, wearing the same socks every day and underpants on backwards. You yep. know, that's <laughs> you're like if that's what makes you comfortable and and under control and nice and relaxed, then you are, you advocate all superstitious kind of. Yeah, the, absolutely. I mean, I actually don't believe in them as such because yeah. that would undermine my job in many ways. Yeah. But <laughs> um, <laughs> that's um, pretty true. Is that? uh, but. You know, but yes, of course, like if athletes say this is what makes them feel comfortable, it's similar to routine. If that's what behaviorally gets you in the right mood or the right mindset you need to be in, fine. Yeah. But it's when it becomes, but it can interfere. So, for example, putting your socks on, checking your underwear backwards and so on. If you had to check your underwear 15 times, take your socks on and off to make sure you got it 100% right. OCD. And then you didn't do your stretching and then you got injured. Yeah. Obviously, that's impacting on your performance. Yeah, so, sure. you've, again, got to keep an eye on it. Someone like Rafael and Nadal. Yeah, he's a classic, isn't OCD he? OCD or rigid. <laughs> what is what is he, what's his what does he do? Uh, he doesn't step on lines. Not, not only bottles lined up. Bottles yeah. have to be lined up. He picks his butt a couple of times. He bounces <laughs> he the ball nine times. That's a visualization <laughs> technique. <laughs> Definitely. I'm gonna hit this. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. really just for comfort, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. You, <laughs> what about Peter Siddle with his twelve bananas a day? Oh yeah. Peter Siddle has to eat. I'm not sure if it's a superstition or maybe it's something that he just does, but I think he has to eat like six or seven bananas. No, he just, he just to get the right amount of vitamins, isn't it? As opposed yeah, isn't to that just overdosing? It's a lot potassium. of potassium. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know I heard that Dermot Brereton used to get 22 shots of caffeine, put it in little um, like a little water um, bottle, mix it up with a tiny bit of water, make it into a paste and eat the paste before a game. Wow. And yeah. 22 shots. 22 shots. I, of I don't, I don't believe you. Yeah. Well, I, look, I, I mean, I heard it on, uh, I have no idea where. <laughs> <laughs> Dot com. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, Demi, if you're hearing, mate, um, give us a call. <laughs> Validate that story. All righty. Um, let's take a little break from the conversation and we'll throw over to Tommy. This is our Good, the Bad and the Science segment. Oh, you want me to hit the jingle? I would love for you to hit the jingle. <laughs> Coming in from Tommy's news desk, it's the gear, the bed, and the side. Well, you got pretty high there. <laughs> you got very yeah. high. <laughs> Sorry, Michael, I don't know. That's the jingle. <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> it is. Okay, <laughs> so uh, this is a, uh, a segment we like to do. It's called The Good, The Bad, and the Science, in case you haven't <laughs> you want me to do the jingle again? Let's do the jingle again. <laughs> what are we doing here? Please no, we've done the routine. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. I've written a song for you. <laughs> uh, we talk about something good, like a current event, um, something bad, we like to open it up here, bit of can of worms sort of stuff, and then something science-y. So, the good... Um, pseudo-science-y. Pseudo-science-y, because we're not scientists. Uh, we like to think we are. We're not yet. <laughs> we will be. Mac is studying in PhD. <laughs> so, this is one that actually mum shot through to me, so thanks, uh, Claude. German town tricks neo-Nazis into rising thousands of euro into raising thousands of euros for anti-extremist charity. Neo-Nazis gathered in a small German town found themselves the target of an anti-fascist prank this week when they were inadvertently raised ten thousand dollars for an anti-extremist organisation. For decades, far-right extremists have marched through. Was the I think it's a place <laughs> in, uh, in Germany, obviously. It's called visualisation. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Visualisation every year to the despair of those who live there. This year, the organisers of Reichs, Gagan Reichs, Right Against Right, took a different approach. So basically, I had a look at a YouTube video. These uh, neo-Nazis are walking along and every step they take adds um, a little bit money to the foundation against 
their march. So it's a really smart idea by anti-fascists to, uh, to raise a bit of coin. My question was, if we're trying to be as diplomatic as possible here, what do you guys think these extremists have to march for in a modern society, if anything? I mean, this, is, this seems like such an outdated uh, an issue, you know, to hear about Nazis and all this sort of stuff. Um, is there any justification that these people have to be walking? Like, what could they possibly be, uh, be, uh, be marching on? Let's throw to Macca. What do you reckon, mate? <laughs> 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 Purely because you pointed well, directly to I Bill. Was, I was seriously <laughs> thinking, fucking not me. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough question. It's it's really a tough. tough question. Yeah. I was shaking my head, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> Look, and th- the reason I wanted to, um, wanted to uh, ask is because I've got absolutely no idea what they could possibly be marching for, you know? Do you have uh, anything to say on this one, Mike? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Something visualisation-y? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> Nazi talk, moving oh, yeah. on! <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. All right, here's a better one. Uh, <laughs> this is why I didn't ask for the script beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I literally had nothing on that one. I, I, yeah. sorry, to, yeah. sorry to let you down. I no, So, so these, were, these were Nazis marching in the street. Mm-hmm. What was the? What did it say in the headline? What Let's was, not resurrect the story. Don't worry yeah, about no, it. We so but it didn't, it didn't say is, what they were marching for? What? Well, it didn't actually say what they were marching for because a lot of people don't agree with anything they've been marching for. But you see it today, like there's a lot of um, groups. The KKK is actually increasing in population in, really? in, the, in the deep south in America. And it's all these sort of, you know, similar things. And I just, I don't really understand how it can be justified. Uh, yeah. You know? It's so funny that in this day and age, I mean, that we're still going through KKK and um, Nazi regimes. I I literally didn't know that the Nazis still existed at all. Mm. It's it's dumbfounds me. Yeah. I have no idea why they would be marching, what they're still doing on the planet, and how the KKK can be oh. growing. It's it's bizarre. Mm. Uh, Nike has terminated its relationship with Manny Pacquiao after the six weight world champion described homosexuals as worse than animals. The th- that's a quote, by the way. The 37-year-old who is running for a Senate seat in his native Philippines later apologised for his comments. We find Manny Pacquiao's comments abhorrent, said a Nike statement. Nike strongly opposes discrimination of any kind and has a long history of supporting and standing up for the rights of the LGBT community. We no longer have a relationship with Manny Pacquiao. He later wrote on Facebook that he wasn't condemning uh, condemning, condemning <laughs> the group. We're having a tough time talking. <laughs> condemning the group, the uh, LGBT community, while still voicing his opposition for gay marriage. So... I'm assuming that's probably based on a religious undertone. My question, what do you guys think? Uh, why do you guys think that many people out there still have an issue with gay marriage? Let's throw to... Who's pointing? Who's pointing? Who's pointing? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I, it depends. When you, Does Manny Pacquiao speak English? Does I that honestly, translate it through the Philippines? I actually would assume that he doesn't speak great English. Yeah, because, I mean, you've got you to gotta really take a lot of that stuff with a grain of salt at the same time. Mm. There's so many literal translations that are not literal translations that the media blow up for no apparent reason. Oh, of course. Did, did you guys hear about the, um, the USC fighter who got um, in a whole heap of strife only about six months ago? I can't quite... Ju- maybe Jacare Souza? He was Brazilian. I think it was Jacare Souza. I know that it was Brazilian for... for uh, I know that... What he did was he was on um, he was on stage. He just won a fight, getting interviewed by Joe Rogan, and he did his um, he did all of his interview, and he's got that very strong Brazilian accent. And at the end of his interview, he said, "Don't forget Jesus, don't forget Jesus." And you know what it sounded like in Portuguese? Nah. No forget Jesus, no forget <laughs> Jesus, no forget, no forget. That's what uh, he said, and yeah. everyone, the whole everything just exploded. He got all his um, sponsors were. Up and about, the USC was going to find him. And then people, Joe Rogan was like, nah, he's Brazilian. Joe, Joe Rogan cleared it up. He cleared it up later down the track. But it was just like, it just blew up out of yeah, nowhere. So yeah. with that Manny Pacquiao thing. Well, the other thing about that is that he says he still voiced his opposition for gay marriage. And he actually put oh. that on Facebook. Oh. So everything he said there is now redundant. <laughs> 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 but Fuck. I mean, in a, general, in a more of a general sense, why do you think there's still an issue with it? Mike, what do you think? Oh, look, I think people are... I mean, a lot of this does come back. I think you kind of touched on religious backgrounds and people mm. have got a fairly strict or live strictly by those and that doesn't allow for um, doesn't allow for gay marriage. And there's people who who are brought up with a set of values who are still stuck in those values. Mm. Um, that we That society has not changed. But I think, as a rule, most of the percentage of society is a lot more adaptable to it. Yeah, definitely. Okay. No, I agree. Uh, 
I agree. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> you would, you yeah. would think you would think in the in the future, like blacks never <laughs> blacks weren't allowed to vote, women weren't allowed yeah. to vote. Um, there's a lot of things that have slowly changed. Still, that's another one that dumbfounds me that it's still around. But you would imagine that in the future, everyone should pretty well get oh, equal it's rights. And that's and that's why I said I agree. It's it's only a matter of time before it happens. Yeah, and that's and, right. and why not welcome it? It's yeah, just right. uh, a bit of the old dick in the bum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I thought that's where you were going. I thought that's where you were going. <laughs> Wash that out. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Jeez, Mac, that is fucking... And that's the end of that chapter. That is yeah. atrocious that that's where you were going with that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the sign? Can we even do the signs now? <laughs> Basically, on what you just oh, said. Oh, we haven't done the signs yet. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and right. that's why people they, they feel they can't get that's married, Bill. Because <laughs> people like you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've kissed more guys than you've had hot dinners, mate. So I'm all good. <laughs> that's a lot of guys. <laughs> that's a lot. What are you saying you had a lot of dinners? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Michael. Oh, man, Michael's just, just getting completely unprofessional here. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what have I signed up for? <laughs> all right, the signs. Uh, finding land for new parks can be hard in a dense city, but not if you put them in buildings. Mm. The concrete jungle just grew some plants. The Bosco Verticale towers taking shape in the northern Italian city of Milan, although private residential towers show the technology is more than possible. So basically, they're, they're constructing towers with heaps of vegetation um, and, uh, and heaps of you know heaps of flora and trees and all this sort of stuff to reduce the carbon footprint. Really um, innovative idea, um, purely because you know we're just... We're getting boggled. It's funny that we're actually reducing, you know, I think they say that the Amazon rainforest is being demolished at like the rate of a football field, football field per second. And yet we're spending heaps of money on, this is something I've just thought about then. They're building, you know, mm. to, to do that sort of thing where they can just leave the Amazon there. <laughs> I don't really understand that, but very good. Mm. Um, so build, my question... Put a building in the Amazon. Well, yeah, they could just build in the Amazon. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to become president. <laughs> 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 So, my question, guys. Uh, Will you vote for me if I go for presidency? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, what are some of the processes <coughs> you guys have put in place to reduce your own carbon footprint? Uh, what's the, what Michael? Sure. Well, yeah, like, because I mean, you know, I'm in the midst of my practice in the midst of Collingwood, and mm. we're in this like a uh, brick warehouse, you know, uh, where even when we're on a blue cobblestone road or still strip mm. um, where we base on so there's actually literally no greenery around and uh, what we're going to try and do is you know we see around with the, the whole wall gardens and um, as many kind of plants inside and outside the building as possible to make it I mean honestly it makes it more uh, we're a health and well-being place who mm. wants to see mm. concrete around uh, we want to see it also um, makes it look better as well doesn't it what's that sorry you know if there's just like a lot of trees and it, it, green is a nice colour yep <laughs> Um, and it makes us feel better and a bit on an environmental well-being scale. Um, it makes us feel better to see greenery around us and be surrounded by that. Definitely. Definitely. Yep. 100%. I, yeah, I'm probably pretty bad when it comes to reducing my <laughs> carbon footprint. Um, Are you, mate? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just don't have any... Four-hour showers and... Uh, no, I mean, I just don't have any particular measures in place that I'm actively trying to help the environment. Yeah. If I'm being honest. Yep, yep, yep. yep. <coughs> yeah, I'm the same. It's funny. I... Um, We've all... Have we all seen Cowspiracy? Yeah. Yeah. So, have you seen Cowspiracy? No. So, basically, um, it was a uh, it was a documentary talking about the effects of animal agriculture on climate change. So, on climate change. I can't talk today. So, um, all of the... You know, He's always all like of this, mate. He's always, always like this. this. That's a lie. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so, a lot of those, you know, documentaries and conspiracy documentaries and stuff, they'll say, you know, you know, Eating meat is bad for you know the the well-being and health of the of the animals and stuff. Um, but this one actually looked at the effects of animal agriculture on climate change. And the biggest thing I took from it was that the amount of land it requires to to feed these grass-fed animals actually and yeah. caged animals and all this sort of stuff. Grass-fed is is it's the biggest one. Isn't that's it? the most unsustainable. Yeah, mm, because really? it takes it actually takes. Yeah. They said in the documentary it takes uh, fifty acres of land to feed one cow throughout his whole life before he's ready for, for um, the slaughterhouses. Yeah. as a very uh, bad way of saying it. But um, a, bit of that, a bit of that's been debunked, I think, the 50, 50 acres of land. Yeah, but it, it is... 49. That's, yeah, no, that's, what it, that's what it is saying, though. Factory farming is horrible mm. 
um, it's terrible. But if we've got seven million people in the world, mm. seven billion people in the world, then if we want to eat meat, we have to factory farm, which is a terrible. Uh, basically, it's advocating a vegan diet. Okay. Um, exactly. Which, which is um, really the only long term, the only long term. Uh, the only long-term thing we can put in place that's going to actually work. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's what I was saying. You know, the, the best way to reduce carbon footprint really and um, lead towards a better climate is to stop eating meat, which is crazy. So uh, don't turn, keep your lights on, just stop eating the meat, right? <laughs> and that was... The good, the bad, the science. Let's <laughs> let's move on. We started to ramble on there a little bit. I think that was good. Good work, Tommy. Thanks. Man. So um, <laughs> Tommy, Tommy obviously mentioned before that he worked with you and he started meditating. So what... Um, not not your visualization, not uh, not anything else. Straight out meditation. What do you advocate? How how do you go about it? So I guess there's for me there's two ways in terms of performance settings. So the the meditation or mindfulness, whichever one you want to use, is a really good way to develop self awareness um, mm-hmm. and a, and a way to understand what's going on in your mind a lot better. Understand what emotions are, what emotions you're experiencing on a, on a regular or semi regular basis so every day, every second day. Then there's a more performance kind of mindfulness where you've got to apply um, and tune into yourself whilst you're in performance. So you might, I guess, a shorter form where you do things in, in split seconds. So, you know, in my main sport of AFL, which is very continuous and you're always involved in the game and it's contest after contest. Yep. What happens, well, <coughs> what could happen a lot of the time, a lot of the time it does, is a lack of concentration What in terms of what leads to errors or mistakes in teams. Is there in one contest their mind is dwelling or thinking about their contest and then they've got to get to the next one. So the, the delay could be 0. 0.3, 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5 a second because their mind is wandering. Mm-hmm. What mindfulness and meditation teaches you is to remain focused in the present moment, one moment or one contest after the other without the mind wandering. So you're less reactive and more what you need to do now, yes. if that makes sense. Mm. So having those kind of spot, like what I call spot mindfulness um, on the field can help you stay more present-minded and therefore your concentration and attention is on the task at hand more consistently over the 120 minutes. So that's what I've been trying to teach the guys to do mm-hmm. as well as the off-field developing <coughs> self-awareness and what's going on in your thoughts and emotions and so on. That's interesting. I, um, I really liked the, the point that you made earlier before the good, the bad and the science about um, when you do sit down with somebody and you, and you actually speak your, uh, your fears and your, your thoughts and the things that you have are uh, going on through your head and it actually, r- you start to realize how silly they sound mm. when you actually put them into into um, into context and tell somebody else about those. Mm. And living in the moment, like you said, with the spot, um, spot mindfulness, living in the moment is basically what we're trying to do at all times with any type of meditation, right? You don't want to mm. think about, dwell on the past, you don't want to think too much about the future, you want to enjoy the now. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, what, tell us about your... Your meditation and your your routines. What do you do week to week? Yeah, look, I've gone through ways I've done courses and done you know very you know structured to semi structured type of meditation. Now I actually find that after doing it for periods of time, I can actually you know involve it in my life. So I'm a fairly advocate cyclist who just enjoys yep. um, cycling away from the city and so on. <laughs> and so I can actually almost in, engage in a meditative state when I exercise, when I'm cycling or running, mm-hmm. whatever that might be. Um, and actually just feeling, for example, your, your foot hitting the ground and, and rolling heel to toe, um, feeling the legs just kind of go over, really engaging that sensory kind of stuff. Yeah, um, that's cool. You know, which you can formulate to exercise or, um, as I said, like the way I kind of might be commuting to work. Um, eating meals is another one we can be mindless with, like we just kind of shovel down meal for fuel and then we rush off to do the next thing mm-hmm. as opposed to savouring whatever we're eating at that point of time. So a meditative state is basically clearing the mind and enjoying what you're doing. Cause, b- because Tommy talks to me about it all the time. Tommy talks about um, when he's playing guitar, how he's, it's his meditation. And when he's, uh, when he's doing, you know, he's doing this or he's doing that, it's his meditation. And that's just a way to basically engulf uh, or be engulfed by what you're actually doing in that time that gives you the pleasure and just to clear the mind. Because basically that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to clear the mind of all that clutter. Well, uh, yeah, clear the mind, uh, it's... It's, clear the, it's not exactly the clear mind. the mind. It's, it's actually being able to focus the mind on okay. what you're doing at that point in time. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a misnomer that you know meditation is a relaxation technique where we're switching the mind off, for example. It's, it's actually not true. We're actually trying to use all its energy to focus mm. on the one particular task, um, which in terms of Tom's talking about with his guitar. And so just being completely engaged with that. Mm-hmm. But that's um, right, because we all are, so many people time travel. 
mm. each and a, each hour of the day, even through this conversation, Bill's looking at his notes right now. So he's he's thinking about what he's going to ask next, and, and, he's, and he's not yeah. actually in the moment. Yep. And uh, I'm speaking to you, and Tommy's just putting his tape on, so he's not even looking at me Tommy's either. Been, Tommy's <laughs> been out of the room for the last <laughs> you know, two and a half minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but you know what I'm talking about. Like, so people are time traveling all the time, <laughs> and I did a mindfulness thing. I did a 30-day mindfulness <laughs> Uh, sort of uh, whatever you call it, um, mindfulness. Retreat. No, I was just I just Course. did it. Yep. No, I just did it for thirty days. At oh, the end of last own. year. Right. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Yep. Um, and uh, it taught me a lot how to be present, and that's when I really got into some meditation and uh, just some. You realize how how many people are time traveling all the time, and mm. I sometimes now, since doing that, switch off conversations because mm. I'll be talking to someone, and then I'm thinking they're not even listening. Yep. And I will just stop my story and yep. I'll just, it's, it's kind of worked in a negative way, but a, a positive way. I'm yep. certainly more mindfulness of myself yep. and the people and surroundings around me, but I now get annoyed because other people aren't so present. Yeah. Mm. And it's really interesting this day and age, isn't it? Because there's so many potential distractions mm. and we're, we're, we're packing our life with more and more and there's so much more we're trying to achieve each day. Mm. Um, but how much of us? How much are we actually focused on the actual one task at a time? Mm. Um, so how efficient are we really becoming? Is the mm. question. It's do you funny. think the the, the 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 social media age is? Do you think it's it's negative in the long run? Because I mean, I've tried to. I'm just bombarded with social media tasks because I have Adventure Radio and Adventure Travel. Um, we've we're on. Listen, to, listen, to this. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Google Plus, Snapchat, LinkedIn mailing lists uh, like the list goes on you know and it's twitter twitter yeah twitter yep. as well big one <coughs> twitter as well and i i've deleted the facebook app from my phone and i've got a um i've got a i have to still be on facebook I haven't actually deleted facebook itself i've deleted the news feed i've got a blocker it puts up oh. a motivational quote um which is good it just does, i don't get sucked into that mm. uh to that news feed but then i'm checking my emails and i still on my phone i don't have a junk mail setting and i just get bombarded with all this information and then i can get it, I, can, I can lose at least 10 minutes a day, five times a day, just so easily. And mm. it's just, I don't know, is it bad for the brain? Oh, look, I'm not going to sit here and say it's all bad versus all good or whatever, mm. but it's obviously something that we need to manage, isn't it? And, uh, and obviously you've identified that it was consuming a lot of your attention. Mm. So you, you went, you made some steps to, to see that occurring. Like obviously it's part of your job, so it's important. Yeah. Like doing, uh, And this is what it's like for a lot of us. How much is social media about our personal lives how much is about our professional lives but how much is it's not really either that we just kind of procrastinate mm. just get, get sucked kind of into in. the digital vortex yeah and then that sense if we're, we're losing a whole lot of time from that then sure it can be, become a negative influence but you won't after the mindfulness I did the 30 days and I don't think I've scrolled on a news feed for a long time yeah but well. it's because because every day I have to you know I've got to do but you don't have to you can just do your status you don't have to look at it yeah, I know. What I, what I was going to say is I do have to do the statuses or the posts or whatever and it's just, it's fucking hard. You naturally just, yeah. But it's, it's sucked it's into a photo or two. It's just do you, human um, nature, I think. Do you guys put things in like no electricity after a certain time at night or? Um, no, I, I, I try and read every day and I try and switch off for 30 minutes at the end of the night but it doesn't really ever happen yep. to be perfectly honest. I, I try and read 30 minutes a day and, and yeah, I want it to be at night but it's not always. Mm. I think the internet's the greatest thing to ever happen. Uh, people are going to be exponentially smarter in 50 years' time because of, the, because of the internet all around the world, I believe. But it just also takes you out of reality so much. There could also be an increase in uh, mental health issues, though, because the world has become more stressful and because you, you can never really turn off. Well, know? is that the case? Look, uh, my theory is that humans, uh, humans really value social connections and human relationships, other human relationships. That's the thing that binds us the most and creates the most, uh, gives us the most sense of happiness and well-being. As a general rule, mm. um, how we connect with other humans is highly, highly important. So, and we know that the most, the, the most efficient way of doing so is face-to-face -face and spending time with people. So the problem with the digital age, I guess, is you're actually going through the, the computer or your phone or whatever to do so. Mm. So you still are having those connections and relationships, but are they as fulfilling as mm. they would be just as you're with someone? Which kind of goes back to your point before when you're talking to someone, mm. They might be distracted by their phone or whatever before, oh, as so opposed nice. to be engaged in yeah. the conversation, yeah. which is we know is the primary form of connection between humans. Mm. Mm. It is funny because I, the other day on my phone, uh, uh, sorry, uh, when I was training, I went on my phone at the Wasting Club, and uh, and one of my friends, uh, a girl, M. Scott, she called me extremely single. She said he's still extremely single. People thought it was um, like I was a player, but it was, she was actually taking the piss out of me. You yeah. know, you still still not have a girlfriend at 30 years old. 
And um, and I put that as a Facebook post on my uh, sitting there on my phone. And then I trained for two hours. I did that deliberately because I knew the banter that would come from my mates. And that genuinely gave me endorphins. Like I was laughing. I was laughing at something. So you do get positive stuff out of it. But yeah. I mean, it's, I don't think it can't be healthy in the long run. Anyway. I think, I think <laughs> it's all about balance. You've got to have the balance right. You know, I am um, big into meditation now. And um, I found, I actually just did it yesterday. I actually meditated with a friend of mine. And... Um, I find that as soon as I can get into my place and just relax a bit, and I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll open my eyes again, and I immediately see the room in a present state, and um, I, you just notice more things. Like I, um, I don't know, I'll, I'll get into that um, state of awareness, and then you, you know, you open your eyes again, and like the, the carpet's more green, or you know, you just, it just, it feels right. And you're not thinking about anything else. Mm. I, I know I've heard a quote or something that like we're only present. Um, 40% of the time that we're that we're around. So I'm not sure or we're awake, but yeah, yeah it's definitely important. I it's think like pressing aware. the reset button a bit, isn't it? Where yeah. things just, when you come to the alert state, you just feel a bit more aware of what's going on about you. Like you refresh the mind and mm. um, ready to start again. Mm, definitely, yeah. definitely. Should we quickly hit um, Book of Creep? I think we certainly should. We certainly should. It is now the Book of Creep. So the Book of Creep is a really quick... Um, thing of like a disgusting or bizarre story. So it's just a, this is a complete 180. You're going to do the jingle? Uh, Give it a go. Okay. <coughs> this is your story. All right. It's time, 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 time. For <laughs> <laughs> the Book of Creep. Right on <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> I read this on Reddit. I used to be a nurse aide. I once had to put a very, very obese woman, she has said very twice, on the bedpan. She was mid-40s, and I left. She put her call light on, and when I answered, she was all done and dusted. I turned her on the side to remove the bedpan, only to see that it's empty. My first thought was that she had been mistaken about having uh, pooped, but then I look and realise that her ass cheeks were so massive, her entire dump couldn't make the length of her cheeks and had gotten wedged in between them. <laughs> I had to dig the entire load out of it by hand. Oh. It was only about two months into the job and it gave me some serious second thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, you were talking about meditation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that was the Book of Creep. <laughs> Is that it? Just a straight <laughs> That's a straight story. <laughs> oh, shit. That's awesome. Hey, Michael, I want to get back to uh, back to some business and talk about some personality types. And I would like you to uh, sort of describe how you would uh, treat sort of different personality types. And the people that come to mind, a uh, um, good hero, of, uh, big hero of mine is Michael Jordan. And he was quite loud and arrogant and overconfident. And he would use sort of psych out techniques. And then you've got sort of the polar opposite is someone like uh, Michael Phelps who comes out with their, with his headphones on and he's sitting down and, um, and you know, he he's has a totally different sort of way about going about psyching himself up. Mm. How do you uh, build a plan with someone after finding, well, I suppose you just got to find out their personality type, right? And then you just connect so from there? Yeah, I'm actually... Uh yeah, in terms of personality, I, I would probably, I probably wouldn't spend a lot of time about what their personality is. I think what we're talking about here is more arousal control. Mm. So on a performance setting, arousal control is okay. What kind of mood or what arousal state, you know, high to low on a scale, do they want to be in um, when they're performing? So and and then then the second step is okay. How do they even engage in that? Mm -hmm. So for example, Michael Phelps when he's got the headphones on, what kind of music is he listening to? Is he listening mm. to? you know, death dance metal. music, death metal, mm -hmm. like to really pump him up? Mm -hmm. Or is he listening to like symphony orchestra mm -hmm. just to relax and calm down, everything to be smooth? And the, the answer could be either mm. because people will have different methods of either increasing or decreasing yeah. their arousal. And how much do you reckon music plays a part? Like for instance, with myself and uh, my members who will be listening to this, there's uh, there's some people that love the music being played and some people that are like, get this shit off. And, and for me personally, I could be listening to the slowest music. I listen just a deep house all yep. the time and it's just quite rhythmic. But to psych myself up, I'm just swearing at myself. Right. Like negative stuff. Yep. You're worthless. You're weak. You can't do this. And I'd go out and I'd try and prove myself wrong. And it just, that fires me up. So music to me isn't a isn't a stimulation. It's more anger. I need okay. to get fired up by something. Yep. So how much does music or extrinsic uh, items, if that's a better yep. word for it, uh, plays a part? 
Yeah, it can. Like it's as, and it, as you're describing, it's really individualized, isn't mm. it? In terms of what you are, and it's actually good that you recognize how you best perform. Mm. You best perform in an angry state. The other thing to consider is what sport we're talking about. So yours is obviously CrossFit. Yeah. Um, and lifting and so on. So you know your angry state really helps because it's you know short power bursts of um of energy isn't it you know that probably wouldn't work for a marathon runner <laughs> um, <You're> worthless <laughs> every, every step yeah. i hate you i hate you i hate you <laughs> so um yeah sometimes it can depend on the sport in terms okay, of what yeah. mood you're in uh how important is it i mean i really like the idea of music i, I think i use a lot with my athletes mm-hmm. i think it's you know a lot of them will have different types of playlists and it wouldn't be just the one mm-hmm. you know they'll have their they'll have their particular arousal point that they're aiming for and they'll check in 15 minutes before them before their performance, and they might increase their arousal with some music and decrease it with others. So and you teach them that point, absolutely. So I know uh, when you're watching footy on TV and they're in the in the dressing rooms, and some people just are sitting down, and some people are out kicking the footy, some people are yelling, getting up and about, some people are just in the corner with yep. the trainer, some people are boxing. Yep. You teach them to check in 15 minutes. Yep. Where are you at? Yep. Right, hit that level and go. So yep. this this was my question actually. Is 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 there we spent a bit of time with Dave, uh, David Riggett, who's generally known as, some people say he's the greatest weightlifter of all time. Some people, he's top three or four, depending on who you ask, set 64 world records in his career. Um, and he said that he, when he addressed the bar, had to always calm himself down. And he was a Russian head coach, and the head coach of the USSR before it disbanded. And that was his philosophy to all Russian weightlifters was mm. you see people that go and they psych themselves up and they get the yell and scream. Like Max, Max approach, which a lot of my friends, a lot of successful people do, his approach was totally different to calm the nerves. Uh, just to be clear, is there no right or wrong way there? So you're trying to find what works for each people and this arousal level. We, yep. we, w- so explain the actual term arousal level and how you get to that. Um, so basically arousal level is, is exactly the best way to describe it is how energized you want to be. And then there's like different types of energy. So for example, if you were using a scale like zero, if I use like a zero to 100 scale with athletes. So mm-hmm. zero could be like you're, sl- you're sleeping. A hundred means we need to take you to hospital because you're jumping out of your skin. Yeah. You know, you're virtually on a, on the verge of a heart attack, <coughs> panic attack. And so you got I try and create numbers of where they want to be on that chart and then you have to play around with it a little bit. Um, but you can be, for example, you can be like Max talking about about an eighty or a ninety anger, mm. but that can be eighty or ninety excited as well. It doesn't mm. have to be just anger. Yeah. Because they're both energized emotions, aren't mm. they? Um, where the relax is a deeper 10, 20, or it's probably a little bit subdued, but 30 or 40. Yep. Um, but you're I right. Think, yes, it's individualized. The, the anger for me just gets me up and about straight away. Mm. And then I'll rest in between sets and I'll mm. tune out and I'll have a joke and I'll have a laugh. Yep. But then when it's my turn to lift or if it's my turn to ward or whatever and I need 10 seconds to switch on, it's just a lot of anger. You're yeah. weak. You, you're weak. You're that, uh, that surprised yeah. me that you're saying because like, you, such you, negative stuff. You can't yeah. lift this. Like, I just tr- go out and try and prove myself wrong. Yeah, I get out and say, fucking come on, like sometimes in my head, like, Mm. It's just the yeah. It's just interesting to hear what other people do. I do Can I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. Is it your voice? I mean, I know it's you're in your head, mm. but do you reckon it's your your words? No, no, I don't believe it. It's it's I'm saying it as someone saying it to me. Yeah. Do you, is there yeah. a, is there have you have an image of that person? No, I don't. I'll okay. note. I'll try and uh, I'll try and. Hey, this is so so <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He's just paying you by the hour. Yeah. <laughs> hey, just before we go any further, Michael, no, no, how no, much no, time? No. I want to I want to delve into this. I think this would be good. How much time do you have? Just so we know. So we've got what do you it's got? another ten. Another ten. Okay, yeah. let's delve. Let's do a little little side right. session. Let's let's see what he's made of. Well, no, no, well, let's not just for the sake of his own. But you know, the, when someone's no, talking that way, you can, you go, can go. Sometimes it's you know, obviously the parental voice. A lot of the time is what we're delving into there. But the, the he may not know that. I'm not saying you particularly, but whoever's in front of me may not know whose voice it is. But they're saying it because their kind of words that sound familiar to them from such a long time ago. That's that deeper psyche that we kind of work with at times. Mm. Um, so you need to kind of capture all who who's saying that to you. Who do you think's against you here? Yeah, Mac. Yeah, well, tell I, us, man. It's not my mum and dad. <laughs> 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 it's not me. It's We're yeah. mates, yeah. <laughs> well, I get you, I, oh, you. Another good general example is around. Um, you hear outside, oh, there's so much pressure. There's so much expectation on me. Mm. I go, oh yeah, from who? Mm. Yeah. True. And then you yeah. go, like, I go name them, name the people for me. Yeah. 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 And, and everyone's happy for them. Their life's good. It's just them, their actually own pressure on themselves. Actually, it's just me, yeah. Yep. Yep. yeah. And it, but it's really good to get them to go through that process because there's actually not that much pressure expectation on them mm. apart from the one they have on themselves. Yep. And, and so how, do you, how would you overcome that? Because being uh, try-hard athletes, <laughs> us three. Um, four. Yeah. <laughs> four. <laughs> <laughs> uh, certainly there has been a lot of pressure put on myself by myself. Uh, so how would you overcome <coughs> that? Is it just having that reality check? 
people look around you who who is putting pressure on you and yep. just go out there and do the task at hand. Yep. Yep. Because yep. I mean, but then there's then you can also go into the fact is well might be working for you. So do we touch that? Mm. You know, because you're saying, hey, I'm doing really well with his angry stuff and it really works for me. Mm. And it's like, well, maybe just leave it for now because it's really working for him. Yeah. Um, but it might become maladaptive at some point. Yeah. And something we might need to look into. I know when I used to play football, there was, uh, I, was I was a key position and um, there was some people that just wanted the ball in front of goal because mm. they thrived on that pressure. They mm. wanted the spotlight. And, yeah. you know, you get the other forwards that are just like, no, nah, no, I'll just handball it off to you. Don't give me the pressure. Yeah. What about the guy that you, you would take the mark and the siren would go. So this is game-winning situation. Mm. And you'd see, straight away, you'd see some of them go, oh, yes. like, yeah. like a big sigh, deep sigh. Or you'd see someone who'd go, and breathe in, and you could tell yeah. they wanted there's a huge chance the this guy's going to miss because yeah. he's already said in his head, yep. Fuck, mm. I can't believe I'm in yeah, this definitely. position. And then the other guys, Michael Jordan, for example, oh, obviously yeah. football, but Michael yeah. Jordan, yeah. give me the ball. Yeah. Give yeah. me the ball. Steph Curry the other day. Yeah, Steph mm. Curry the other day. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was yeah. amazing. Do you guys see that? I did, but I'm, I'm agreeing. A 32-footer. 32-foot. Oh, wow. It was yeah. like yeah. five, six feet back from the three-point line. Yeah. Game winner in overtime. Overtime. Yeah. Jeez. Um, it was insane. Yeah. yeah. So, so one of the, I would say, the highest pressure pressure you could face in sport would be a, a golfer going for a putt to win the, uh, to win the, say, US Open or something like that. Yep. You would have to definitely just focus on this putt and not the outcome, I suppose. So you just, yep. you teach people to focus on the process, not the outcome. Yep, so we would want them, it's like the final shot after the siren. It's yep. We want that completely robotic. They've done this a thousand times before. Mm. So they don't go back to, see, pressure is all interpretation of the situation. Yeah. I've got to do this now because it's a good line. of like the that. outcome. Mm. Yeah. As opposed to, no, no, you've done this a thousand times. Yeah, It's the same process. It's the same routine you've done. You practice this over and over again. That's all you need to do. So yeah. that's to be almost emotionless. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We're trying to be... It sounds odd from a psychologist, but emotionless is highly automated. beneficial. Yep, yeah. automated. automated is a good word for yep. it as well. Mm. Thanks. Mm, glad. That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice word, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, um, I wanted to ask something um, that kind of applies to me, but um, um, maybe to, uh, to others as well. I, I initially came and saw you um, about footy, but the second time I came and saw you was because I had a um, bad reaction to drugs. So it was to mushrooms. Mm. And... Um, I got a lot of anxiety from it, and I'm I I recently actually just started sort of reflecting on it, um, you know, and then um when I heard you you know we came to come on the show I thought that was awesome. I've been having this thought in my head, and it's been okay. I've had this anxiety um, from taking mushrooms, and it caused a lot of experiences that were negative for me, and a lot of a lot of stuff that I've addressed. Um, I now have an anxiety in my head where it's if I don't confront this and don't take them again or take a psychedelic drug again I'm living a life of restriction and I'm not because my goal in life now is to eradicate every fear and do the complete opposite of what anxiety always tells me to do what what's your viewpoint on that I remember I remember something how you know drug induced anxiety is a bit different to normal anxiety but I wanted to hear your, your thoughts on that well I guess what I'm trying to is uh, first thing I'd like to hear is you talk about is you talking about well I don't want to I want to stop avoiding mm. So fear elicits avoidance. So what I'm trying to, you want to confront everything that you might have been fearful in the past. And so you feel like you need to keep on ticking a box to do this as opposed to the one, what am I doing this for? Mm, mm. Yep. It's definitely the, the, what am I avoiding stuff? Like I've looked back and all the boys know here that I've got like, I used to have a massive fear of ghosts and I've, I've got rid of that now. I can watch any horror movie. Um, little, <laughs> little things like that. Um, but yeah, like it's become a thing where it's just like, you know, I just want to, it's become a goal that I want to get rid of them all, you know. It um, sounds very, I mean, it's, it's very ego-driven, isn't it? Like, yeah, I've got to beat everything yeah. to be, feel successful in Is life. Is that a bit of an OCD thing as well? Oh, kind definitely. of that you, ha you have to you have to eradicate it. Isn't it okay to be f fearful and anxious of a few things? Well, I don't know. I just, I, I love the idea of being, like, completely present and lightened and aware mm. and just, just... Immortal. A complete bliss. In I'm anxious yeah. and well, then scared then of if a fucking heap of stuff. Yeah. Mm. Like, but is that good? Well, I think it's natural, isn't it, Michael? Isn't Absolutely. It I mean, yeah. it's part of our it's part of our human instinct to survive. Mm. That we are yes. fearful. We need to be in our order to survive. That's mm. why we we don't take risks on everything. Mm. Yeah. If it's something that you want to do, obviously, mm. then you want to try and like for me, it's diving. Yeah. I've always been I've always been a mm. surfer, but whenever there would be a couple of guys get a wave and I'd be the last person sitting out the back mm. on my surfboard, I would literally start looking around. Really? It's fine. I've never paddled in from the water because of anything like that. 
but I'm not very comfortable with deep, yeah. deep water. Yeah. So I wanted to do some diving. Yeah. I really, I think it'd be a great experience for one, but I also want to go over that fear. So that's something that I yeah. want to conquer for that reason, but I don't, I don't necessarily personally need to conquer everything because, mm. yeah, I think anxiety is a bit healthy. Yeah. Of I mean, the simplest way to put it is, well, why do you look both ways when you cross the road? Safety. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, don't you get, get over that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good, pra- good practice. So you're going to conquer that fear as well? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll conquer that fear. Fear cars, yeah. <laughs> reds. I'll never see you again. <laughs> Cross the M1 without looking. Like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, and for, for me, the um, psychedelic drugs comes from a, you know, I, th- I think it is safe if you do it right. I've got a really sort of objective opinion on that. You know, and they can be really enlightening and give a good message and stuff. We've spoken about this on a previous podcast, so I would like to attack that again. Mm. I'll just, yeah, it's interesting you said it's very checklist and... There's still a fear, h- hearing that in your voice, I don't know if we can talk about it, but I think you want to do it. I think you have a big fascination of it, but I'm just thinking that you're fearful of it. Mm. I am. I'm fearful of having another negative experience on it. Yeah, that's a big one. Well, day. before Michael has to take off, should we try and get nine from nine out just quickly? Sure. Um, yeah. Have you got a couple more minutes? Sure. So we've got nine from nine. Nine from nine is nine questions in nine minutes. We'll probably try and condense them so you can be a little bit shorter with your answers. There's three from me, three from Mac, three from Tommy. And Mac normally starts us off. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> let's go, Mac. Uh, my first question. Meditation is your nah, first nah, one. That's, so that's, 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 nah, that's, that's my ritual second daily. one. Oh, yeah. What, what's your morning ritual? <clears throat> my morning ritual? Yeah. <sighs> well, currently, it, it changes. But currently, um, I've got a young one. So generally, I get up with him, coffee, spend some time with him. I generally do some form of exercise mm-hmm. and then get off to work and, and do kind of my daily work from there and I try and come home and relax. So, But I like the idea of spending some time at home with the family, doing my workout or exercise and then going on in a, in a right headspace to, to work with others for the day. Yep. Mm-hmm. Try and get a win early. Try and get a win early, yeah. yeah. Good stuff. So do my self-care as much as possible, the meditation, the exercise. You yep. do all that in the morning? Do it all in the morning. Cool. And how so how I'm ready that, to go for the day. How long that take? A couple of hours. Yeah, it wow. encompassing getting up and mm-hmm. spending time with my kids and all those type of things. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. Uh, my second question is, do you meditate? My, uh, I'm going to elaborate on that because we know you do. Uh, when would you suggest people meditate in the morning? Good question. Uh, whenever it's again, they've got to work out what's best for them. I'm, I like the one in the morning. I actually also like the, I actually like the mid-morning and mid-afternoon. I do know? mid-afternoon. Yeah. yeah. But that's only just because uh, uh, I don't want to get up any earlier and I think if I meditate... When I get up at five, I'm gonna probably fall asleep. So I do yeah. it in I do it in the yeah. uh, mid afternoon just to refresh myself yeah. and and energize myself for the evening classes That's right. and evening work. Yeah. Yeah. De- it depends on the structure of the rest of your day a lot of yeah. time, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, third question is uh, the best date you've be- ever been on, or describe mm-hmm. your perfect date. A perfect date. I'm just after date ideas, really. <laughs> 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 Max extremely single now. Yeah. <laughs> Need some help. <laughs> well, I mean, I think this will go, this will tie quite well. This is, this is a true story. So when I met my wife, the amazing race was going, it was just kind of coming out to Australia. And, uh, Did you go on? No, well, we always talked about, you know, she's athletic, and I'm like, okay, we're supposed to be smart. Yeah. We're going to go, oh, we could just nail this show. We just got to get on it. And it wasn't Australian one we applied for. We didn't, uh, we didn't get approved or we didn't get asked to come on the show. So what I did, my uh, engagement proposal to her was do a whole amazing race, oh, tank oh, episode cool. uh, around the country. Um, really? One day. Wow. Oh, well, sorry, that's an exaggeration. <laughs> Melbourne to Margaret River. <laughs> <laughs> but she still had to go from Melbourne to Margaret River. Yeah. <laughs> that's across the country then. That's, um, uh, that's cool. And yeah. so what were your clues and games? Um, so it started off that she had to be outside Richmond train station six in the morning. I got a cyclist friend of mine to give an envelope. Took her straight to the airport, blah, 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 blah. Um... She had to join the Mile High Club, of course, to get across. <laughs> <laughs> she had to do she had different roadblocks and dares and yeah. so on. And yeah. it took probably, it was a, may have been, I don't know what time it was, a night by the time we got it. Margaret River, it would have been around 7, 8 o'clock. Wow. And I proposed there. Do That's we skip over the Mile High Club thing there? Yeah. <laughs> 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 like, my, my brain exploded and then yeah. I was like, no, 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 no. The best part about that, though, I actually told the staff and they go, and they told them the whole idea and they go, oh, what can we do for you? They were what? like, happy to sit yeah. it all up. <laughs> yeah. Listen, take Michael. note, everybody so, listening. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you're telling on a plane, tell me you're engaged, you're about yeah. to propose. Yeah. So me and Mac are going out. <laughs> 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 Let us uh, that's, uh, that's great. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll use that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Today. Oh, so, yeah, so my questions. My questions are um, favorite destination you've ever been to. That can be city, country, small town. Margaret River. 
<laughs> Cubicle of the <laughs> F7 yeah. France. France Air. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Australia flight <laughs> to Margaret <laughs> River. Why I said that? F7 I said F. France Air. Anyway, anyway, sorry. So, so he, went, he went hostess <laughs> yeah. France. That's yeah. right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, your favourite destination? Well, uh, another thing that well, we did in terms, of, in terms of the adventure, which if you guys haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. We went to Cape Town together. And uh, we did what they call kloofing. My mm. favourite city in the world. Oh, right. Yeah, so it. Cape Town itself was like, yeah, awesome city. The but there's this thing called kloofing in the mountains that you could do and doing all these jumps um, into like basically our form of canyoning, but they just call it kloofing, which mm-hmm. is just typically just jumping, no ropes, nothing else. Right. Um, really cool fun. Uh, it's the best. Cape Town's. Mm. So um, my next question is uh, your favourite, uh, or your dream destination, sorry. So same again, come anywhere. Dream destination. Look, there's a few. I'm I'm really interested in doing. I like the idea of doing adventure travel. So adventure fit travel. Adventure Come to the right place. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> we can help you out there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where am I again? Yeah. <laughs> South Melbourne. Uh, the last one I like to do. I like to do. I like to mountain bike the west coast of US through Vancouver, through the Rockies up to Alaska. Oh, cool. Um, cool. Do some climbing, mountain biking. Cool. Awesome. Do some mountain type stuff in the summer. Yep. Be nice. I think winter could be a little cold in that area. Yeah, for mm. sure. All right, well, moving right along. So, uh, last question for me is: y- if you're stranded on a uh, on a desert island oh, and really? you've got three, you've got three. With that vanilla, <laughs> you've got three <laughs> things you can take with you. You've got all your necessities. Three things to keep you sane. What are those three things? Three things to keep me sane. I would need something. I would need a ball. You know, I need to do something kind of active with a mm-hmm. ball. I would a, need a ball. Yeah. What type of ball? Uh, Foot. No, it doesn't I'd have to be. I'd have to be round because you get a bit more multidisciplinary with a round ball, couldn't you? Yeah. Just a big kicky ball. Yeah. <laughs> does, does, does a, does a <laughs> ball... <laughs> what about a wazoo ball that bounces on the water, you know? Because you've got to be on the yeah. island. Yeah, yeah. that's not a bad idea though. I like that. Whose yeah. island are we going to? Uh, <laughs> I've been trapped on one before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you got your kicky wazoo ball. Okay. <laughs> I, need no, I need another human being. Yeah. Uh, so let's call it my wife okay. at this point in time. That's a Just big sell out of here. <laughs> 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 but yeah, fair enough. Good on you, Mike. <laughs> yeah. All right, you got another human. Oh, you give me your suggestion. <laughs> yeah. I've got shrooms. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what's, your, what's your third? Air France hostess. <laughs> yeah. She can come along, yeah. <laughs> well, I need something for the water as well, won't I? I need something to paddle on. So let's well, call what's it your, what's, your, what's your partner? What's, what's your, your wife? What's your wa- You're not going to bring anything for her? <laughs> Romance ended after the plane ride. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call a surfboard. Ah, oh, surfboard. Yeah. Okay. A couple of people have said that as one of their questions. Mm. And I uh, I followed up with, the island has no surf, though. Just okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can paddle on it, right? Yeah, that's I need right. something to paddle on the yeah, water. you can yeah. paddle on it. Yeah. Stand up paddleboard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, biggest role model growing up? Biggest role model growing up? Um, it's well changed. Oh, it certainly has changed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You've got to inform us, Tommy. Well, Sorry. <laughs> You know, when I was a junior footballer and I was growing up in, and I was a Melbourne supporter, and the position I played was, you know, pretty uh, like an attacking wingman. Stephen Tingay was my man. Oh, he's my favourite. Yeah, yeah. Number 22. Yeah, no. <laughs> Damn it. His first one was 52. No, but he was number two in the end or number two? He was number two in the end. Because there was right. two guys with long blonde hair, number two and number 22. Because my grandparents <laughs> oh, you made me. Dug uh, yourself out of this Jeff Hilton yeah. was 22. Jeff yeah. Hilton? Guy. Yes, that's right. He had long blonde hair at the time. He did. Because my grandparents made me a, um, a member of. Uh, of Melbourne Football Club yep. and I went for the Bombers the whole time right. and I would always go they'd drag me along to the games all dressed up and I would literally walk along going but I don't want to <laughs> go to the game I go for the Bombers but I ended up uh, finding out all the <laughs> Melbourne players and Tingo was my favourite player so that was uh, another jingle yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I go for the Bombers <laughs> <laughs> so yeah he all was right. my man let's move on because okay. I'm getting paid out on uh, <laughs> best thing to do when you've got some downtime um what do I do with my down? I, I try and exercise as much as possible. And I like getting out as much as possible into into green. I live near the Yarra Trails, so I do a lot of mountain biking, trail running. It would be those two things because it just it really is great for my headspace. Yep. If cool. I did that 45 minutes an hour a day, I'd be a happy man. Yep. Beautiful. And my final question is, if there were three people dead or alive you can invite to dinner, who would they oh. be? Yeah, big. We answer the big questions here. <laughs> dead or alive? Yes. So not dead at the table, but they are dead now. <laughs> Just make sure you know. <laughs> <laughs> they can speak back. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hypothetically. 
Um, well, my, my kind of role model sports psych that I, I always kind of follow and really follow his career, really interested is the Seattle Seahawks one, Michael Gervais, mm. who I've learned a lot of my work from and take a lot of interest in. Um, yeah. I'm never related met him. to Ricky? <laughs> He's not, uh, is he? No, I don't know. Okay. Ricky Gervais. Ricky no, Gervais. That's all. We'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible gag. <laughs> Terrible gag. Um, yeah. <laughs> so he's one I'd be really interested in having around to find out more because he's kind of the one I, in my career. He's someone I really kind of role model on. Sure. Uh, who else I like there? Probably let's look at the kind of best athletes in the world right now. I'm really interested in like a really so curious to meet Steph Curry. Yeah. yeah. Steph, you know, he, you know, can we hypothetically, hypothetically say he's going to be the next Michael Jordan? Can we say that? Well, I'm a next very, very big NBA uh, NBA fan. And I think he's the best shooter to ever play the game. Mm. He just set the he just set the record for... Uh, broke his own record for most three-pointers set in a season with mm. 24 games to go. Yeah. Wow. wow. It is insane what he's doing, what yeah. he's doing right now. So I think if he can string together five years at this pace mm. and he can win two or three more championships, mm. he'll be in the he'll be in the mix of the top five for sure. Yeah, okay. Wow. That's my thoughts. What about sure. you? Yeah, no, I think he absolutely could be. I think he's already in the t- he'll be in the I think he's already pretty much the top five. I'm really interested in someone Ooh. I'm really interested in now finding out because he could go further. In the he's interested in the the best spot of his career, isn't it? Wouldn't it be great to interview what's going on right now? Yeah, yeah. he's such a good like well rounded dude too. Like his his yeah. mum and dad, his dad Dal Curry played NBA. His mum and dad are at all his games. He brings mm-hmm. his daughters, I think, yep. two yep. daughters to all his games. Just a happy, just a LeBron James is the same. He's a big family man. It's a it's just good to see professional athletes who just yep. seem so yeah well grounded. I would say. Yeah, I reckon the th- and the third one is like I'd like to get a guy who's the epitome of mental toughness and, and doing everything they can to get the best out of themselves. Mm. Rocky Balboa. No. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, Leighton Hewitt. Ah, really? Yeah, oh. really. I'd be really curious now. You know, he's, he hasn't really quite retired because he's playing this weekend. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm really interested in someone how I'm interested into entering his mind. Yeah. Mm. And all of what everything that he did, how he sustained that over such a long period of time yeah, to get cool. the best out of himself. I'd really That'd like be a really to interesting that. dinner. Mm. Yeah. He wouldn't have had some, it was, he just would have had someone like you though. Well, I, well, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm guessing no. Yeah, I reckon I he's so he's self-made. Himself. Yep. Wow. I really do. He seems a bit that way, I think. He's just, yeah. he is, isn't he? He's just yeah, tough just and gritty. Yep. And really squeezed every ounce of Mm. I reckon it's just, it's just him. It's part of his mm. yeah. DNA. Mm. Yeah, right. But, you know, he could do my job, I'm sure, by just replicating whatever he's done. Although maybe it's been so automatic he couldn't even articulate it at the same time. Yeah, yeah it's probably just a natural function mm. for him just to be such that a scrapper is. and so, yeah. so mentally tough. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. That's cool. cool. Awesome. Well, I'm sure you've got a very busy afternoon, Michael. So that 10 minutes that you had left uh, was about 20 minutes ago. Minutes ago. <laughs> Apologies. Well, Sorry yeah, about that. Right. So um, thanks heaps for coming on the show. Where Thank can you. people find you? Just quickly. Oh, yeah. So my practice is the Mind Room. Uh, it's Five Glass House Road, uh, Collingwood, in terms of where my practice is in Melbourne. Um, www.themindroom.com.au um, if you want to find a bit more about myself, um, the other psychs, my team that work there. Um, and all the different things we do around meditation and classes. So we run a whole lot of workshops and seminars about benefiting uh, the mind um, as opposed to being mental health focused. And so people really like those classes because they're there to learn something that we all can learn, mm-hmm. no matter if uh, you actually are going through a mental health issue or you're actually doing pretty well in life already and just want to improve it even more. Can yeah. I ask just to continue on with your, your plug there? How much do those classes, um, how much, what's classes the structure with? Pardon? Glasses. Glasses. Yeah. <laughs> <say> glasses. <laughs> Visualization. <laughs> Visual. Yeah. Uh, how much are they? Look, they kind of vary depending on the Quite actual packing. technique. And also, there's some that are considered beneficial for mental health, so you can get a Medicare rebate for them. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, so they'll they'll vary from, like I'm going to have mine coming up soon, my class, of, it's going to be a six-week mental conditioning course. And cool. that'll be around the three fifty four hundred dollar mark for cool. six weeks of an hour and a half session. Wow, yeah. that's really interesting. That's, that's cool. something that I would be actually mm. yeah. keen on. That's Definitely. that's only that's a you know. A I'll send you the I'll, I'll send you the plug and yeah. for yeah. it, and you can we're, spread uh, it around. We're we're thinking of doing a, a mindfulness challenge uh, off the back of mine from last year. Okay. A six week, uh, four to six week mindfulness challenge at the gym. Okay. Would we be better? Like, could we just run that through you? Absolutely. You can. We do like a mindfulness in May kind of thing, so that could kind of fit into that. I think that's when we actually say. <laughs> 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 wow. Look at this. Yeah. Well, thanks for the free session. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, All right. Hi, mum and dad. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks well, for having me on, guys. Yeah. Thanks yeah, again, thanks Michael. Thanks very much. And uh, that's a wrap. 
Alrighty, guys, that was our uh, podcast speaking to Dr. Mike Inglis. Um, real shame he couldn't uh, hang around a little bit longer today. I had something, well, something to go to. He was probably just trying to get out of here. <laughs> but uh, no, I loved it. I um, really, really enjoyed speaking to him. Hey, guys, just a couple of quick things to go to before I leave you alone. Please subscribe to our iTunes. So if you look up Adventure Fit Radio on iTunes, it'll come up. Please press subscribe. Please rate and review if you can. Um, that would be awesome. Even if you hated it, just leave something in there. Any any press is good press, <laughs> except for the bad press. Don't give us bad press. <laughs> um, guys, if you want um, any specifics from the show, something, um, something you liked that was cool or something you want to go back on, our show notes are up on our website, www.adventurefittravel.com forward slash podcast. So any of the stuff there, guys, check it out for us. We'd love you to. We want heaps of exposure to that website because we think we're pretty cool. And if you guys jump on the website, that makes us look pretty cool. <laughs> uh, guys, please jump on our mailing list, adventurefittravel.com. Uh, keeps you up to date with when we release our shows. Keeps you up to date with um, uh, travels and, uh, and holidays that we're, we're about to go on. Again, like I said at the start, guys, Bali's coming up. Get your tickets. And finally, team, I just want to quickly thank the uh the sponsors let's get the sponsors up mr bill insert middle name he's currently getting the sponsors up guys all righty here are the sponsors team so we want to thank atlanta orchards guys atlanta for Kanzi and green star apples again they've been trialed in australia for years and now in commercial production so ask for atlanta Kanzi and green star apples in your local green grocers victoria what loxam solutions Boutique consulting and business support company focused on a business consulting and commercial services. Check them out, team. They're, they're sick. And MDO Sups, guys. Check out MDO Sups. If you drop ADVF radio at MDO Sups, you will get 10% off all your supplements. So please check them out, guys. They're a, uh, a newly for company that uh, aspires to build a trusted brand by having honesty, integrity, and loyalty as the cornerstones of their relationships. Thanks again, guys. Speak to you soon. Discovery Roger, go for deploy.